Okay, this is a video on photographing your artwork using a DSLR camera, polarized lights, and a color calibration system. Since uh, this is something of a repeat of the video I did last year, this time I've put chapters down below so you can skip ahead uh, if there's anything that you've already heard and find exactly what interests you. I'm gonna briefly mention each of the things I use, then I'll talk about each thing in depth, and then finally I'll take a couple of pictures and I'll show you how they all work together. So to start with, I have a DSLR camera, I have a macro or a micro lens, I have a circular polarizer, I have a remote system so I don't have to touch the camera, I have it tethered via USB to a computer, I have a computer with software on it where we can uh, edit the images, I have a couple of soft boxes and inside the soft boxes I've taken out the lights and replaced them with high quality LEDs and I'll talk about that. On the front of the lights, I have a polarization sheet, and I'll show you how that works together with the circular polarizer to make sure we don't get any glare on our painting. I have a number of calibration systems. I have a painting that needs to be photographed. I have a little setup I've made to where I can place it. I have a couple of gray cards. I have a light meter on my phone so I can uh, make sure that the light is even across the front of the painting. And last, I have a calibration system for my monitor so that we can make sure that what we see on the screen corresponds accurately to the colors in the painting. So now I'll talk about each thing in depth and I'll start first with the camera. It's a Nikon, it's a D800. It's an older camera, it's about nine years old. I realize it's older technology, but this is a channel on oil painting, so we'll try to keep some perspective. It has a very good sensor in it. And when I was looking to buy a camera, this was what interested me was the biggest sensor I could find with the ability to take high quality lenses. So the Nikon D800 series is sort of their professional series for large images with tons of information. So if you're looking to get a new camera, um, the D850 I think is what's out now. They've also started making mirrorless cameras. There's the, the D7 series, no, Z7 series is the, the new mirrorless cameras with the large sensor. And you'll see I jumped through a little hoop to make sure I don't get any vibration from the mirror. So in theory, if you got a mirrorless camera, you could skip that step. The mirrorless cameras are great. I'm actually filming this on mirrorless cameras. So I've used them for many years. But this, when I was looking to buy a camera, this was used, didn't have a high shutter count. And I'm very happy with it. So before that, I used a, um, this is a D7000. This is the camera I used for about eight years, and I can show you later on the difference in the, the photos that we get with the two, but uh, these are also great cameras. If you're looking to save money, you could get the, the Nikon uh, DX series, so you have the 7000, the 5000, and 3000 series. One thing to keep in mind when you're looking at DSLR cameras is a lot of the newer technology is for, you know, shooting in lower light, stuff like Wi-Fi, uh, you know, a better value range. All of these things aren't really that important to photographing your artwork. For one thing, the value range in an oil painting is already quite compressed. You don't need to shoot a, a bunch of photographs very fast, and you can even stitch together a bunch of low resolution photos to, to get one high resolution photo. So these are all things to consider when you're looking at getting a camera. You do want the ability to take very good quality lenses though, and that's another thing that Nikon has going for it. You can find a lot of good quality lenses. And you can also use old uh, used lenses. This is a, a 105, it's a manual focused lens, but uh, here in the studio photographing artwork, we have all the time in the world to focus. So I use this very happily for many years. The reason we want a macro lens is because they tend to be very sharp lenses and they're also what's called a flat field lens. So it will take a picture where there's not gonna be any distortion in your painting and anything that's a centimeter on the, the edges of your painting is gonna be the same size as a centimeter area in the middle of your painting. The next thing to think about is the focal length. If you're shooting in a small space and you want to shoot a large painting, you'll need a shorter uh, focal length. So this is 40 millimeter and I, I had this when I was working in a small room to shoot large paintings. This was my go-to lens for uh, taking pictures of very small paintings because it basically acts like a zoom. This, now that we have a very large studio, is a nice balance between the two. So I basically have this all the on all the time and I just move the tripod back and forth depending on the size of the painting. It's a 60 millimeter and I'm very happy with it. On the front of the lens I have a circular polarizer and I'll show you how that works in conjunction with the polarization filters on the light to make sure we don't get any glare. This is by B&W and 
I have uh, some cheaper ones and they work just as well. But so circular polarizer, good quality macro or micro lens and a DSR, DSLR with a, a very good sensor are what we need in a camera to photograph accurately our artwork. Now underneath the camera, you wanna have a sturdy tripod. Uh, this one I picked up used. Uh, it's from a little English company called Three-Legged Thing and works great. It's very heavy duty. I actually use it for uh, painting large paintings outside. Okay, so these are the lights. It's a softbox setup I got online. And what I've done is swapped out the light bulbs that it came with. So these are the LEDs and they're very, very bright so that they will come through both the um, softbox and the polarizing filter. The other thing is they're what's called a high CRI, which is the color rendition index. So it's something to look for. If you're ever working with artificial light, you wanna get a high CRI bulb. Basically, I think it's a 97. They're very, very bright, like I say. They even have little fans you can hear whirring inside them. So be careful when putting it into these soft boxes because uh, they're very fragile. And then the next thing you need is these polarization seats. And I put a little link uh, down below where I've managed to find them. Um, thing to remember with the polarization sheets is they have to match up with each other. And if you put them sort of sideways or backwards, they're not going to work. So I've written upper left in the upper left corner of uh, on my sheet. And then you have to make sure that all of the light that comes through the light box goes through the polarization seats. So that's why I have so many of these ridiculous clamps, basically to, because my polarization sheet is a slightly smaller than the soft box. And any little light that comes through the side is going to create glare on your paintings. I use all these clamps to basically push the soft box behind the polarization filter. And for the same reason, you want to make sure that your windows are all closed and your lights are turned off and there's no light hitting your painting other than the light that's coming through the polarization sheet. And you'll see that using a polarization filter in conjunction with the circular polarizer on the camera means we're basically able to remove all of the glare, even on a really, really dark, glossy painting. Okay, so after we've set up the lights and made sure our polarization sheets are good to go, we'll turn them on. And now we want to make sure that the light is evenly distributed. There's two ways of going about this. Now, either you can use a dedicated light meter, or in my case, I have a light meter app on my phone, and it seems to work pretty well. And you can basically just make sure that across the whole front of your painting that the light is more or less evenly distributed. You can also use a measuring tape and make sure that the distance is the same. Now. I've moved the lights to film this, so they're not the same. But anyways, you want to make sure that the light is evenly distributed across the painting. Another thing you can do is set up a white card. And what this does is, first of all, just it allows you to see, if you stand back, how well the light is distributed. But the other thing you can do is take a photograph using the same crop as you're going to use for your painting. And you can apply what's called a flat field correction to your profile. So basically, it's going to look at the distribution of light, and then the software will analyze that distribution of light and apply it to the photograph of your paintings. Once the lights are good and the distribution of light is good across your painting, you need to set up the camera, and I'll show you the best settings for photographing your artwork with a Nikon DSLR. We'll go into the menu and into the shooting menu. Uh, the bank is a good way of saving all of these settings. All of this stuff is for storage and naming. The first important thing we have here is the image quality, and you always want it to set it to RAW, like on uh, calls it NEF. And then from there, the next thing you want to make sure that your image area is using the full sensor. So in this camera, I have the DX crop turned off, and I have the image area set to full frame. The, a lot of this stuff is for JPEG, and it's not really important to us. The NEF recording is... I have it set to lossless compress just because it makes the file slightly smaller. And then the bit depth, you can either set it to 14 bit or 12 bit. I mean, if you're shooting for screens, keep in mind that most people's screens are either 8 bit on a phone or maybe 10 bit on a computer. So, um, you know, 12 bit is way more uh, information and 14 bit is a ton of information. So I often have it set to 12 bit. Uh, right now we're shooting images recently for a book and so 
it's set to 14-bit. Uh, the white balance, uh, picture control, a lot of this stuff is for uh, JPEG settings. So the white balance, I actually usually have it set to 5400, which is the white balance of my lights. Basically, we're going to get the white balance right in uh, post in the software. And so we, it doesn't really matter here, but you do just want to be able to see that your image doesn't look weird. So I have it set to match the lights. But you can also uh, take a photograph of a gray card or a white piece of paper and set it that way. Color space, if you know what you're doing, you can set it to Adobe RGB. Otherwise, for most uses, sRGB is fine. All of this I have off. And then we'll go into the custom settings. Again, you can uh, save it in the bank. Autofocus, I use um, autofocus single all the time because it's we're taking a picture of us, something that's sitting still. So AFS, and I always have it set to focus which basically means that it won't take a picture unless the image is in focus, because often I'll take a photograph where I'm standing in front of the camera using the remote, and I want to make sure it's in focus. Since we're just shooting a flat surface, uh, we don't need to, to play around with the focus too much. It's really easy to get to a good focus in this situation. Exposure is how photographers change the value range in their photos. The cameras are designed to come up with a, an exposure it looks good in photographs. It may not correspond that well to paintings, so I never really trust all of the auto exposure stuff or even the meters in the camera. But um, you'll see later that I tend to use the live view and the histogram just to make sure that we're not getting any clipping and we can change the, the exposure in the software. So, Okay, so the self-timer is important. I have it set to two seconds, and I often use the self-timer if I'm taking just one picture of a painting. Basically, we don't want any movement from touching the button, if that's what you're going to do, or even if somebody's, you know, if you're walking around and you get a bit of movement in the floor. So the self-timer gives you two seconds from pushing the button for the camera to stabilize. Two seconds is plenty of time because I often combine that with, so the timer, and then this exposure delay mode. Now what this does is, with these mirrored cameras, you can get a bit of vibration from the mirror lifting up. Now that tiny bit of vibration can make the photograph a little bit blurry. So I realize it's kind of uh, ridiculous that we spend so much time trying to make sure we get razor sharp photographs after we've spent so much time trying to get soft edges in our paintings. But uh, we want basically to have the painting accurately represented, so sharp edges. Show up as sharp. The exposure delay mode combined with the self timer give you five seconds from you pushing the button. So two seconds for the camera to stabilize, then it'll raise the mirror, wait three seconds, and then it'll take a photograph. So basically it means you're not going to have any movement in the camera either from pushing the button or from the mirror coming up. So it's very useful. If you use mirror up mode, which is what I used to do up here, Mirror up mode does the same thing. You push the button once and it raises the mirror and then you push it again and it's because it's got the exposure delay. It'll take a picture and drop the mirror. But by using exposure delay mode, you can uh, basically have it on the timer and it means you only have to push the button once, which is really useful when you're using a remote. So the viewfinder under grid display is very useful if you're looking through the camera and trying to make sure that your painting is perfectly parallel with the front of the camera lens so that we get a perfectly rectangular uh, photograph. So yeah, the other things are for flash, for personalizing the controls, and then the movie mode. The last thing that I find quite useful is the autofocus fine-tune, which you can find demos online on how to do this, but basically you just take a bunch of photos, zoom into 100%, check the pixels, and decide on the sharpest value, and then after that you'll get a... I find it actually makes quite a difference in the autofocus on the lens, okay? That's it for the settings in the camera. Now, as far as the actual settings of the camera. All of this stuff down here is what we've set in the menu. So here, basically, we always want to set to manual mode, and you want to get your f-stop at whatever is sharpest for your camera and your lens combination. Now, it's generally sort of f6 to f11, depending on what you're using. I took a bunch of pictures, and f8 is the sharpest for this lens and this camera. I have it set to f8, and as I said, um, 
you know, this is the shutter speed, and you can see the exposure there to uh, make sure you get a pretty even exposure. I'm using um, sort of center weighted exposure where it looks at what's more or less in the center and decides what the exposure should be. The other thing that's very important is the ISO. And you always want to have the ISO set to 100 on an icon camera because that's the base ISO and that's going to get you the best quality image with your sensor. Turn the lights on. And now I usually switch to live view and this gives me a little grid to make sure that the, the camera is parallel with the painting. Basically you want to make sure that you're always getting a perfect rectangle because if you shoot a, you know, with the camera at a slant or something and you're getting a little bit of a trapezoid, it's trivial to correct it in post, but you're going to be stretching your pixels a little bit, so you're going to get a slightly softer um, image. Now we'll turn the circular polarizer to where we don't get any glare on the target. Since you can't really see it that well here, let me show you with a dark painting where I've turned the lights almost parallel with the uh, camera, just to show you how it uh, really gets rid of all of the glare on a dark, glossy painting. Then we'll turn on the histogram. And basically this little uh, display shows us the range of all the values in the, the image. So by changing the shutter speed, we can move the value range up and down. Basically you want to just make sure that there's no clipping. So you don't want anything going off of the, the right of this, the little rectangle, and you don't want anything going off of the left of the little rectangle. If all of your values are in between those two sides, you're golden and then you can uh, adjust the values, they call it the exposure, in um, the software afterwards. One last thing about the histogram is there's a theory that shooting with the lighter side of the, the histogram, basically pushing everything as far to the edge as possible without and getting any clipping will get you a better quality image. The idea is that the way the sensors are built the lighter part of the sensor uh, captures more detail. So there's, it's called uh, exposing to the right, and you can look it up. Uh, it's not something I do, but I've played with it a little bit. I can't really see a difference. Focus, push the button, wait for the timer to go. It raises the mirror, and then it takes the photograph. Okay, so normally I would just be photographing one card, but uh, for the sake of this demo, I will take photos of all of them. And once we've shot a picture of the calibration card, we can go ahead and, and take a picture of our painting because after we've imported the calibration card, we can make a profile and then apply it immediately to, uh, to the painting. Once everything is set, um, F8, ISO 100, take our picture. Okay, so after we've taken our photographs of our painting and our calibration cards, First thing we're going to want to do before we start working on the computer is to calibrate the monitor to make sure that the colors we see on the screen accurately represent the colors in our paintings. What I'm using is a hardware calibration device. It's made by X-Rite. It's called the i1 Display. Basically, you plug it into your USB port and hang it so that it's touching the screen. And then you run it through some software. It will uh, look at, analyze the way your screen represents the colors. It will make a profile that then you can apply to your system and then you're going to see the correct colors on the screen. Now, one issue is that the software that x -Rite makes is not very good in my experience. I was never able to get very satisfactory results with it. So I'm using some open source software called DisplayCal and that uses a, a library of colors. It's also open source called Argyle. So you'll have to download those two things. I'll put links down below. And then the first time you start up DisplayCal, it'll ask you to uh, point it at the Argyle color libraries. And after that, it will be able to use the colors to make an accurate profile. So it's kind of a complicated uh, piece of software. So you might want to research exactly how to use it for your monitor. But the end result, I think it works very well. Today, I'm going to calibrate this, my little screen. This is actually, I have two screens. 
This one is a Dell. It's actually quite old now, but uh, it has an excellent LED panel in it. So it shows um, a very wide gamut of colors. This one, even though it's a much bigger monitor, actually is not as good quality for seeing colors on my screen. So this is the monitor I tend to trust more. And what we will do is set this up. First thing I'm going to want to do is go into the monitor menu and uh, do a factory reset. This is basically going to give us a clean slate to uh, work from. So then we'll open Display Cal. For this demonstration, I'm just going to set it to uh, basically their, uh, their sort of auto. So we're in Display and Instrument. I've set it to sRGB. I found my display. This is, uh, since I have two displays, this is my Dell. Here, your instrument is going to show up automatically. Here, you want to set it to LCD. Here, this is kind of complicated. You want to figure out the technology for the panel in your screen. And a lot of times, it's going to be this um, WLE, white LED, I think it stands for, uh, family. Like my other two monitors that I've had in the past were both uh, WLED. For this, they have some specific monitors listed, and one of them is mine here, the Dell U2413. So that's what I'm going to pick. Then we'll go into calibration. Uh, you want to have the interactive display adjustment set. Uh, the white point, we'll leave it as at measured. I find the white level this is basically the brightness. I find it's uh, too bright with their settings. So I'm going to set it to 120, because I sometimes use the computer in the evenings, and I want it to be kind of dark. Tone curve will set to sRGB, calibration speed to high. Then we'll go into profiling. Now we can um, show the advanced options and make sure it's set to single curve and matrix. And otherwise, we're just going to use uh, auto optimized the amount of patches it does automatically. And then from there, we'll hit the calibrate and profile. So now you want to make sure that your uh, little you want to make sure that your little calibrator is set in the center and that there's no light sort of coming in from the side. So you can tilt the screen back a bit to, uh, to make sure it's, it's resting well. Then we'll hit start measurement. And basically, it's going to run through a few of these patches and see how our device works. When that's finished, you can click start measurement. And now it's going to run through a few more patches. And when that's finished, up here we have our uh, interactive display adjustment. And here's where you're going to want to go back into the menu, find where you can um, set your uh, brightness and your uh, color. So first I'm going to lower the brightness down until this little guy starts moving. And then when it turns green, we basically have it uh, set to what we want. And then we'll go back, go down to color settings. And I'm going to go on my menu. It's called custom color. I'm going to go into the gain. And then since the green up there is the, the highest, I'm going to lower that quite a lot until basically all of these line up. And because I've lowered the green a touch, uh, I've lowered the brightness. So we'll go back to the brightness and raise that. And when they're both green, we can go ahead and hit stop measurement and continue on to calibration. Now what's going to happen is it's basically going to run through the patches for 10 minutes or so. And then it'll come up with a profile that we can save close the program, and it will apply the profile to your monitor, and then you'll see accurate colors, okay? When it's finished, go ahead and click Install Profile. You probably have to put your password in. And now it's uh, going to activate the profile, so we'll see all our colors correctly. And now we can close Display Cal and go ahead and fire up Capture One and import our photographs. Now, the first thing we're going to want to do is put our memory card in. It's going to open an import images dialog. You want to make sure that your adjustment styles are set to none. We want the, um, want the images to be completely clean for this. So we'll go ahead and import all six images. 
Now they should all be clean, so there's nothing to uh, undo. You want to find the ICC profile. You want to come to effects, and you want to set it to no color correction. Then you want to make sure that the curve is set to linear response. After you have those two things set correctly, what you can do is go ahead and copy it using their copy icon, and then you can select all the images and hit apply. So it's a nice way to quickly apply uh, settings in Capture One. Next, we are going to uh, crop things just to make it a bit easier to work with. And we'll crop them individually since they're all different sizes. Now, one thing to consider is here I'm cropping our, uh, this is the IC 8.7 card, and I get the best results with this. It's my favorite, and it's also, I think, the least expensive of all of these. So I've put a link below where you can get it online. So we'll go ahead and crop that. And now I'm going to go to Adjustments and set the, the crop in the composition. Apply that. I'm going to copy the crop. And then I'm going to come down here to where I photographed the whiteboard and then make sure crop is selected again. And I'm going to apply the same crop to our whiteboard. And you'll see why later. But for now, let's just go through and finish cropping these other ones. And I think that's it. So once we have them all cropped, you can go ahead and click Export Variant. And then here you get a dialog. We'll save them on the desktop. Uh, give it the naming format of, um, we'll use a preset uh, naming format of the job name and a one digit counter. This down here is very important. You want to set the format to TIFF and 16-bit. Then options uncompressed. And here is also important. You want to have it set to embed camera profile. Scale 100% and go ahead and export it. So Capture One has this great uh, process tab. So if you need to do a batch of images, it makes things very easy. So in this case, I have a TIFF set with the same settings, TIFF 16-bit embed camera profile. 300 pixel per inch, 100% uh, scale, destination set to the desktop. Uh, similar name, not exactly the same, so we don't uh, overwrite the one we did. But now if I click process, it will actually do all of these in one go, so it's very convenient. So once we've exported 16-bit TIFFs of all of our images, we can go ahead and open Luma River Profile Designer. Now I'm going to hide Capture One just so it's easier for us to see what we're doing. Now you want to go up to your the menu and go to Mode, Profile Format, ICC Profile, and Profile Type. I have the reproduction version, so it makes things much easier. I'm going to set it to reproduction. Otherwise, you'll have to look at the settings if they're doing uh, using the Pro version. First thing we're going to do is click Load Image. We'll get an Import dialog. The first one we'll use is the IT 8.7 card, as I get the best results with it. When we've opened it, you want to go to Illuminant and set it to match your lights. So I'm, my lights are about 5400. I'll set it to 55. Here you want to find your card. So we'll go down to IT 8.7 Reflective, and it's actually specially made for the ColorAid C1 card, which is what I have. Here you can uh, load the the custom reference if you're not using a C1 card from ColorAid, but since we have the exact card, we don't need to. Now you click Show Target Grid, and it's going to show you this grid with these little colors, and you basically want to get them to match up. So you drag these little guys to the corner, and you can zoom in as well if you um, want to make sure it's really precise. Once you're sure that the squares are all lined up, go ahead and click Grid is in Place. Now, this step is optional, but if you click Load Flat Field, it brings up the Import dialog, and here we can import the white card that we photographed under the same light and that we cropped using the same crop as the IT card. So now when we open that, 
it's basically analyzing the way the light hits the, the white card, and it's going to apply that to the IT 8.7 card. So we can go ahead and hit render now, and it's going to come up with a profile of the colors. Then we can optimize it. Now, I generally set this to neutral from white patch, and the white patch I leave on auto. The LUT type, as I said, I'm using the reproduction mode. Headroom, I find from reference gets me the best results, and then they recommend uh, auto relax with L. I have no idea what this means, but uh, it gets good results. Now we'll render it again. So now we'll go to export ICC profile. It's going to ask you where you want to save it, and I'm going to go ahead and save it as IT87. It usually finds where to save it automatically. Here it's going to save it. This is OSX, so it'll save it in the library, color sync, profiles, and then Capture One will be able to use it. So Now we'll go ahead and switch targets. And this time we'll do the color checker SG. Change this. Mine is an older card. These cards are crazy expensive, but I got mine on eBay used. And I, like I say, the, I find the results are not as good as with the IT 8.7 card, but I don't want to bash uh, X-Ray too much because my card is quite old. So it's possible if you got a, a brand new card, you'd get better results. Grid is in place. Now, if you're using the color checker SG, it will automatically analyze the little white patches, so you don't need to use the flat field compensation. It still remembers all of uh, white patch and headroom from reference. Then ICC export again. This time we'll save it as color checker SG. And then we'll keep doing this for the other targets. Color checker passport. The QP card. Okay, so now we'll quit Luma River. We'll go back into Capture One, and now we need to restart Capture One. And now when we select the image of our painting, you can see that this is set to no color correction and linear response. But basically what happens now is if we come down to other, now it's going to show us the profiles we just made. So QP card, passport, um, this is the IT87 that we just made, and the color checker SG. So you can see how they're not all exactly the same. Now with my camera and my lighting setups, the IT87 is by far the best. And like I say, it's the least expensive of them all. And this is almost exactly what my painting looks like. I'm holding it here in front of me, and it's almost perfect. Now I should qualify that by saying that the ambient light where I'm observing my painting is playing into this as well. So I have a north-facing window. It's overcast today, so it's a neutral light, warmer than usual. And another thing I should mention is that I haven't checked these with uh, spectrophotometers or anything. That's not maybe what this video is about. This video is about uh, calibrating for artists to look at their own artwork uh, on screen, to be able to archive their artwork. And then if you're going to be printing and you have a 12 or 14 bit raw image in focus, shot with a good lighting setup with no glare, you'll be able to get good quality prints with these images. But back to our IT 8.7 profile, the only issue I would say we have here is the blues, and I've had this problem for decades, are always just a, a shade too green. And it's not the monitor, because if I you know, move the image to any other screen, it, the blues, it just doesn't kind of capture the warmth of the cobalt that I use. So what I like about Capture One, too, is it has this advanced color editor. So basically, we come to Color Editor, Advanced, and then you can select the color that you're not happy with. In my case, it's the blues. And then you can change the smoothness, the hue, the saturation, the lightness. What I often will do is just change the hue 
tiny bit. You can see if we pull it all the way this way, it goes very purple, and all the way that way, it goes very green. But I usually just move it up a touch just to get it a little bit redder. I'll set it to five. And another thing is if you want, you can get use a, a gray card to get exactly the white balance. Copy and make sure that it's just set to uh, white balance. And then we'll go back here and click apply. And that is perfect. So this, again, you know, it took us a while to get here. It's certainly an investment, but this is basically one click, perfect uh, color rendition of an oil painting. And honestly, I'm very pleased with this result. So a few more tricks though. Um, if we want to crop, we'll notice that despite my attempts, you can see down here that the painting is a slight trapezoid, which I was trying to avoid. So what we can do there with Capture One is you have what's called keystoning. And you put the keystone with the four points on it, and then you drag these little dots to the corners. and then click Apply. It's basically gonna make your trapezoid a perfect rectangle. It's a, a great little tool if you didn't manage to set the painting up in a way that it was perfectly parallel with the, the camera lens. And then last, we will crop it. I often take a bit off the sides just to match uh, the effect of the frame. There we go. It's almost a perfect uh, rendition of the painting. And if you uh, zoom in to 100%, you can see that because of the center of the camera, we're able to get a, a, just a ton of detail. You can really see the glazing that I've done in the, over the impostas. And it's, um, I think it's a great quality image for what it would cost to have a professional photographer come once to photograph a handful of images. So, and like I say, this is the system I'm using now, and I think it works great. But for those of you who want to see how to do it with, uh, with Lightroom and a DNG profile, we'll do that now. Okay, so now for Lightroom, the first thing we're going to want to do is actually uh, download and install Adobe's DNG Converter. And so we open that up, select uh, the folder, and then we'll go into our the Nikon D800 SD card, select the folder with our images, and it's set to save to the desktop, so we'll save it there. Its document name is fine, DNG is fine. I don't think we need to change any preferences. We'll go ahead and click Convert. Now it's going to convert our files and put them on the desktop. Now we will go ahead, quit the DNG Converter, open Luma River, and like before, we'll load our images. Start with the IT87. So Illuminum. D55 again like before. Now we're gonna have more choices here because it's we're not using the reproduction version of Luma River. So set it to IT 8.7, show target grid. Okay, so that looks good. Click grid is in place and then we can load our flat field up as well. Should be the same size. Okay, so we'll skip target for Illuminate number two. In optimization, neutral from white patch like before. Matrix optimization was at the auto. We're gonna leave it at the general purpose, even though I've paid for the reproduction, but we'll just go through it this way. LUT optimization will set to auto relax with L. Tone curve, we're gonna to set to linear. Turn off automatic black subtraction. Look, we'll set all of these to neutral. Gamma compression will turn off, base look neutral, and then we can render. And now here, one thing that's kind of annoying with Lightroom is you have to name it here. So we'll go ahead and call this IT87, and we will export the DNG profile. Now it's going to automatically find Adobe Camera Raw camera profiles and save it there. So that also conveniently comes up with a name, but like I say, we're, we're not gonna see this in Lightroom, so it doesn't really matter. 
And now we will go ahead and do our other images. Okay, so now we can close Luma River and open Lightroom. We'll come down here to import. Select the Nikon D800. Now, as opposed to Capture One where we actually need to run these through Capture One to make our uh, profiles, we've already made the profiles. So we can turn these off and we only need to import our image. So here's our image, looks great. Now if you go to develop, profile, and then click browse. If you scroll down here, these are the ones we've just made. So we have the color checker SG, the IT87, the passport, and the QP card. They all look pretty good. Now, as usual, I think the IT87 just does a better job of getting those greens. You see, my greens are pretty bright, and that's what it looks like. So again, I'm going to take the IT 8.7 and I will close this and that's pretty good I mean that's about 90% 99% there I would say the only thing again is that the blues I'm holding the painting and comparing it again though the blues are maybe just a touch uh, too green so we'll just uh, take it up a tiny bit, uh, make them just a touch redder. And so that's our image. Uh, same as with Capture One, you can see that uh, the image quality is great, lots of detail, and the colors are excellent. So then like before in Capture One, if you have a painting that's a slight trapezoid, you can come down here to transform. I think it's here, it's horizontal. It'll straighten it out for you a touch. Then we can go ahead and crop. And that looks great. Okay, so I thought we'd do some comparisons because uh, this, for me, has been a 10-year project and I've tried different uh, systems, different cameras, different color calibration cards, different software, and I thought I'd just kind of run through um, the various options and show you how they differ. So this is within Lightroom and uh, these are the, the four calibration cards we're using, the IT8.7, Color Checker SG, this is the Passport, and this is the QP card. All of them look really good and uh, you could tweak the chroma, what do they call it, saturation, a bit to, to get the colors more accurate. And like I say, you can um, individually tweak the colors a touch and I always need to tweak the blues. But still, these are four very good uh, solutions. I find that the IT8.7 right out of the box uh, gets the sort of high chroma greens that I uh, used. And it's very easy to tweak the blue, which I find to be the only thing that's off. So this is my favorite of the bunch, but they're all very, very good. We'll go back to Capture One for another comparison that I was always curious about. I mentioned at the beginning that I used to use a, a Nikon DX camera, which are far less expensive than the full-frame Nikons. So I just wanted to show you quickly the difference between a full-frame Nikon and a DX crop Nikon when photographing artwork, because it was something that I was always curious about, and I have recently upgraded to a full-frame. Like I said, it's a nine-year-old camera, and uh, you can get them used these days for the price of a, the new uh, high-end DX. So I think they're a great deal, and I'll show you here why. So I've taken this photo with the Nikon D800 and this with the, let's go over the information pane. So this is the Nikon D7000, and this is the Nikon D800. Everything else is the same, the ISO, the aperture, um, the lens is the 60 millimeter micro lens. So here is 
the D7000, here's the D800. Now ignore the, the shift in the chroma because we're using the profile that's designed for the, the D800. I didn't shoot a separate profile. What I just want to show you though is the amount of detail that you're able to capture with the bigger sensor. So here at dimensions, the Nikon is capturing 7,000 by 5,000 pixels and the D7000 is capturing 5,000 by 3,000 pixels. And when we zoom in, it becomes very obvious at 100%. So this is the D7000 at 100%. And this is the Nikon D800 at uh, 100%. And you can see you're just able to capture a lot more detail. Your brushwork up here, there's, I mean, it looks like dry brush, but it was uh, the Nala Prima painting. So, But you can see you get a lot more of that sort of interesting uh, painterly effect and you're able to really see what is going on. So same photo, same crop, same lens, uh, same setting, same light. And the only thing that's different is the sensor and the uh, Nikon D800 just is able to capture a lot more information. Down here, this is um, the D7000 with a used manual uh, 105. I'm not sure if it captured that information here. The focal length is the 105. This was a very inexpensive lens, whereas this is the, the 60 millimeter, and this was a very expensive lens. So I just, and it's an autofocus. I just wanted to show you here that uh, getting a manual lens frankly, does not uh, change much. Now ignore the sort of uh, difference in the exposure, but you can see that the, the sharpness of the, the focus is just as good. The amount of detail is just as good with an old used lens off of eBay. It's very easy also to focus using uh, a manual focus lens with the Nikon because it gives you a little green dot when you're in focus. So those are a few things that I was curious about when I was starting out, what is the difference in photographing artwork between a DX and a full frame Nikon. So there you have it. And then another comparison we'll look at is going back to our original painting. So here is the uh, ICC profile. Here's the IT 8.7. Here's the color checker SG. Here's the passport. Here's the QP card. Here, this is when I used X-Rite's own software to um, create the profile rather than Luma River. And so if we go back up here, I think we can see very quickly, this is the color checker SG using Luma River, and this is the color checker SG using x rite software. So actually, I would say that um, x rite software does a better job of capturing the sort of warms in the, the blues that I said was one of the issues that I was having earlier. So this, I think, is a, is a very good rendition of my painting. I feel like between that and the IT 8.7, I just think that the colors here, even though the, the blues are perhaps a touch better with the x rite I think that overall the actual chroma contrast, the colors and the greens uh, looks much better with the IT 8.7. That said, the color checker SG, I was able to get better results using the x rite software than the Luma River software. And we'll look at some of the other ones. Okay, so this is the Passport using x rite software. And this is using Luma River software uh, with the Passport. If you have a passport, you might want to skip Luma River because it's not nearly as good as what x rite gets. Again, comparing it to uh, IT 8.7 and Luma River, I think that the colors are slightly too dull, but it does do a good job of getting the reds in the blues. Now we'll see them all together. Okay, so this is the color checker passport using x rite software. This is the color checker SG using x rite software. This is the QP card. Now QP card comes with its own software, but I uh, was unable, there it is there, 
I was unable to get it to work and I gave up after a while. So this is the QP card run through Luma River. This is the color checker passport run through Luma River. This is the color checker SG run through Luma River. And last we have the IT 8.7 card from Colorade run through Luma River. So that's so uh, you can compare them all. And then last, I wanted to show you uh, this, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, what you can do with Luma River is also have a number of targets. This is actually only available in the uh, reproduction mode. So if you shell out for the re reproduction mode, you can uh, load up a whole bunch of targets. So this is uh, all four targets thrown together and then exported to uh, an ICC that I've named here uh, Multi. And it actually does a pretty good job. It gets the, the high chromas and the greens, and it gets the blues to be slightly uh, redder. So this is it compared to the IT 8.7, which I still think is a touch better uh, with regard to the greens. So those are some uh, comparisons. I'll talk briefly as well about the difference between Lightroom and uh, Capture One. Now, one thing I like about Capture One is you pay for it once and then uh, it's yours. Other things I like, as I said before, are the process recipes, being able to export a bunch of stuff in batch and saving in different folders with different recipes. I like uh, being able to apply the styles and I like the adjustments clipboard a lot. I really like the advanced color editor, the fact that I'm able to fix one particular color that I'm not very happy with. And down here, if you want to play with the curves, one thing that's kind of cool about Capture One is if you switch it to Luma in the curves, you can um, play with the exposure without changing the saturation of the colors, which I found very useful. If you often, if you use the RGB, and play with the curves, it'll change the saturation. Whereas using the Luma in Capture One allows you to change the exposure without affecting the saturation of the colors, which I find very useful for uh, tweaking photographs of artwork. Uh, another thing that's very useful in Capture One, as the name would implies, is it's actually very good for capturing photographs well tethered to the camera. So if you start up the live view, this is now attached to my Nikon, and you can go ahead and focus. You can change the focus. You can uh, zoom in, which I've actually found this useful for manually controlling the focus, uh, especially if you have a big screen next to where you're working. It's often easier than using the, the viewfinder to focus. I guess you can put a grid on to, to make sure it's perfectly square. And these are the capture adjustments. And what we can do is apply already our um, ICC profile to where it's going to be uh, saved. And you can even change your shutter speed uh, directly from here and it will tell you what your exposure is. So you can really control everything from within Capture One. And, th and then when you push the button, it will uh, photograph your image and import it directly into the software. So I don't use this very much because I'm often photographing a number of paintings. But if you're photographing one painting, uh, this can be very useful just to be able to, to capture while tethered to the camera. So something to consider. Going over to Lightroom, I'll talk about the things I don't particularly like about Lightroom are that it's a subscription service now. Uh, Adobe makes you pay basically a yearly fee. Now I use Photoshop a lot. And so for me, the Lightroom price includes Photoshop. So I think it's uh, $10 a month or something for Photoshop and Lightroom. Still though, I mean, Capture One is 350 euros right now. So after three years, you can, you know, you still own Capture One and uh, Lightroom starts to get more expensive. The other thing that's kind of annoying with Adobe is that they just, they install just a ton of junk on your computer. It's quite shocking how much stuff they're running in the background. I guess a lot of it is to, to make sure that the, the software isn't pirated, but I don't think it's very hard to find pirated software from Adobe, so I don't think they're 
system is working really well. It's just really annoying to honest people who are paying for it and then have to run a whole bunch of other uh, processes. On the other hand, good things about Adobe Lightroom, it's uh, probably much easier to use. Uh, certainly, Capture One has quite a big learning curve. I found uh, Capture One has a lot of great tutorials, but it's a lot. it has a lot of stuff that I feel isn't as intuitive, at least for me, than Adobe. The other thing that I used all the time uh, with Adobe, now this isn't my real library, this is just one I made for the video, but uh, being able to quickly upload to Flickr, which is where I keep uh, high quality images of all my paintings and to be able to control from within Lightroom your Flickr albums. Uh, I thought that was very useful. So uh, that's what I would say are the things that I thought worked uh, the best about Adobe Lightroom. And I think I prefer their library to um, all photographs one. I find it much easier to navigate the, the Lightroom library as opposed to the Capture One library, which is uh, over here, like that, for example. There's just a tons of times when I want to do something and I find that uh, Capture One is less intuitive to how the library should work. But other than that, they're both great programs and they're both excellent at adjusting and simplifying your workflow, storing all of your images, allowing for ratings and tags and uh, keywords, dates, places, so that you can uh, quickly find your images. And then to be able to quickly uh, export stuff as well is obviously very important. So both Adobe and Capture One allow you to come up with presets, which allow you to quickly export your images in formats that are the ones that we use all the time, you know, exporting for emails to galleries or clients, uh, blogging, social media, print quality. They're both great in that. But I thought we would do one final comparison. We'll look at the exported images and how Lightroom and Capture One both render the colors, the values, the chroma of our paintings in the final image. So. We'll go ahead and make sure everything is the same. So this is our image uh, with the IT 8.7 profile. This is the DNG profile we made in Luma River. White balance is set to as shot. Um, I made the, I raised the blues a touch and we cropped the image, but otherwise everything is more or less the same right out of the box. So we're gonna go ahead and export that and we'll export it to the desktop, uh, name it Lightroom image format JPEG, color space sRGB, quality 100. Uh, we'll resize it to 2000 pixels and 72 pixels for inch, no sharpening. So, and now we'll do the same in Capture One. This is our IT 8.7 ICC profile made in Luma River. Uh, curve is set to linear response, white balance is set to shot. And I think the only thing we changed again is we just changed the, the blues a touch and cropped and straightened. So we'll go ahead and export this to the desktop format uh, JPEG, same ICC profile embedded in the image, the sRGB, resolution 72 pixels, uh, 2000 pixels uh, long edge, adjustment, no sharpening, and I've actually already exported and opened them here in preview. So this is Lightroom's export and this is Capture One's export. Now I've sent these to a couple of other computer screens as well as my phone just to see uh, what the color rendition looks like on other devices. And it's more or less the same. As you can see, there's a slight change in hue, but still they're both excellent quality images. Funnily enough, I looked at these over a couple of days and on one day we had blue skies here and the cooler uh, Capture One profile looked more accurate to my painting in the studio. And then on an uh, overcast day, uh, looking at the image from Lightroom, which is a touch warmer, actually looked better. So a lot of that will have to do with uh, tweaking your white balance now I've used the white balance on both of these is set to as shot. 
but I think that the Lightroom certainly looks a bit better now. To be honest, I think my painting looks more like the Capture One. Um, and I think the Capture One is more accurate overall. The oranges look better. Uh, the, the, um, the ochres, the grays here, the red up above, uh, the blues, the shadows in here, the, the kind of the warmth here. I really examined these uh, quite thoroughly. And I think overall, the, the Capture One just does a better job at the end. Now these files are just open in uh, Apple's preview and I'm not sure how good they are at uh, showing the colors. So I've also opened them in Photoshop. Now just to make things confusing, I've uh, switched them by accident. So this is the Capture One and now this is the Lightroom. And if we zoom in to 100%, you can see as well, there's something with the contrast where Capture One actually does a better job of showing the impostos and uh, the glazes. So even though the contrast elsewhere looks to be uh, pretty similar. I think that overall Capture One has just done a better job of uh, rendering the image. So now that's not to say that with a bit of tweaking you couldn't get uh, an equally good image with Lightroom. But we're talking uh, straight out of the box here. I think uh, Capture One is the winner. Now Using uh, the ICC profiles means you have to spring for the pro version of Luma River, which adds uh, 70 euros to the price tag. So uh, I think overall the, you know, the initial layout for this whole system uh, would be quite expensive. Now, I've been uh, building my system up over the last 10 years. And as I said before, uh, having a professional photographer come to your studio for probably two uh, sessions with a few paintings would cost as much as all the equipment in this video. So, and it's not just that, it's also, I uh, felt like when I had professional photographers photograph my artwork, they weren't as concerned with the final results as I am. I mean, it, to me, it's very personal and I've really put in the time to, to try to figure this out. So that's what I'm trying to share with you. I think another thing that's important to remember when you're uh, weighing whether to hire somebody or learn to do it yourself is that, uh, is, there, is the convenience. I mean, there's lots of times when you need to have a good photograph of your image quickly for a client or a gallery and organizing photographers, you know, can be kind of a hassle. So I think that uh, learning how to photograph your paintings well is something that every artist needs to do. And so that's been the point of this video and I hope you uh, get something out of it and it helps you uh, make better photos of your artwork. And uh, thanks for watching.